Hi, my name is Wes Anderson. I'm Vice President of Agronomy for Croptimistic Technology, an ag tech company based in Saskatchewan, Canada. And in this video, I wanted to talk about SWAT maps. So what are SWAT maps? SWAT maps are soil, water, and topography maps. And they're a soil foundation map typically used to do variable rate fertilizer, seed, soil amendments, soil applied herbicides, and even variable rate irrigation. SWAT maps are a trademarked and patented process. So they're based on soil, water, and topography. Again, and these three things are all interrelated, of course. Soil would include things like soil texture, soil organic matter levels, topsoil depth, and in some areas, levels of salinity. Water, of course, is the biggest influence on yield, and areas can lose yield due to too much or too little water. And sometimes that can happen even all in the same field, all in the same year. But it's important to delineate which areas are relatively wet and relatively dry for the purpose of understanding both yield potential and even nutrient movement across the landscape. Topography, of course, sort of drives that water flow across a landscape. So we're talking about knolls, mid slopes, and depressions. Topography, of course, influences water. It also is sort of the underlying factor that, that drives erosion. Uh, so topsoil typically moves from the tops of knolls down into depressions over a period of time, either from wind, water, or tillage erosion. That in turn affects organic matter levels, things like pH, and ultimately soil nutrient levels that we can measure in a soil test. So a little context, the SWAT maps always have 10 zones. We make them relatively high resolution to match today's equipment and, and future abilities of equipment to apply things at a really high resolution. And it can accommodate even the most variable landscapes that way too. So the one thing that's common with all SWAT maps, no matter where they are, zone one will always be relatively dry, the driest part of the field. And that could be due to texture or landscape position or often both. And zone 10 would be the wettest part of the field. Now that doesn't mean that zone 10 is the highest producing part of the field because yield is a function of both spatial and temporal variability. It's a dynamic layer that really can alter or change year to year depending on rainfall and, and even the crop. But this is a general context from zone one to 10 being dry to wet. Um, and again, that would be based on both texture and landscape position in most cases. And we typically see this pattern with topsoil depth, for example, from zone one having those relatively sh shallow topsoils, often lower organic matter, to zone 10 having often more organic matter and deeper soils. So that has quite a dramatic influence in the soil's ability to supply nutrients to the crop. Graphically, if we were to look at this, it appears quite complicated, but the key thing being we start out with these two key layers, so topography and elevation and parent material, or in other words, basically texture or what type of soil it is, and in some cases, levels of salts or sodium. But it's really these two things that go to drive all these other things that we need to understand to ultimately get to what we really often are after, which is what can the soil supply to the crop and how much more do we need to add to maximize yield potential? Yield potential is driven primarily by water and we wanna make sure that we're supplying enough nutrients either through what's in the soil or through applied nutrients to maximize that yield potential. Another way of thinking about this would be in this matrix. So we're used to quite thinking about yield potential zones. We've had access to yield data for well over a decade now. We've had access to NDVI imagery, which tends to yield uh, or tends to delineate areas by yield potential in, in mid season, sort of, but our brains have you know, been geared to think in the context of yield based zones, but really absolute yield potential doesn't determine fertilizer response, which is what we really need to understand to actually provide an ROI with variable rate nutrients. 
So for example, we might have a high yield area, typically high yielding area anyway, with relatively low fertilizer response. So this might be a really rich fertile depression with lots of topsoil, lots of mineralization potential and access to water. So that might be where your crop often lodges, for example, and there's an opportunity to actually minimize the amount of applied nitrogen and better match it to what the soil is supplying and, and what the crop needs. A low yield potential area with low fertilizer response might be like a saline depression, for example. It's always going to be low yielding because it's salt affected. It's also going to have low fertilizer response because partly because of the low yield, but partly because those areas also have heaps and heaps of nutrients from being over fertilized for many, many years, typically. We might also have, say, an eroded knoll, for instance, with relatively low yield potential, but actually can have quite high fertilizer response to nutrients like phosphorus or sulfur, for instance. It might not respond that much to nitrogen, but this matrix is actually unique to each and individual nutrient. So in the case of, of an eroded knoll, it might actually respond really, really well to phosphate because all the phosphate has been eroded off that area along with the topsoil. So we're really trying to determine what is the limiting factor in each part of the field. Is it water? Is it nutrition? There could be a lot of other things that affect yield at the end of the day, but we need to focus on the underlying stable factors uh, like water and, and soil and, and nutrition that could be managed year over year. So in this field, for example, we look at zone one, it's a relatively sandy soil, low organic matter. There's always going to be water limitations, typically in, in, in most environments. You'd have to be in a really high rainfall environment for this area to not be water limited, really. It's also acidic and would likely respond to lime. There's also some nutritional issues that could be addressed through fertilizer fairly easily. On the other hand, zone 10, that actually has fairly similar yield potential in this field, is poor for very, very different reasons. It's relatively wet, poorly drained because it's higher Cape clay content, also relatively high sodium, so very poorly drained sodic soil, and actually salt affected too with moderate EC that we measure in the soil test. So lots of nutrients, it's not nutrient limited, it's limited by too much water and poor drainage and some salts. So again, this is important. While these areas might yield the same, they might even look similar on NDVI, and they do, they should be actually managed entirely differently. And, and that's the important point here. So how do we make SWAT maps? Well, what's unique about SWAT maps is they can accommodate multiple layers of data that all go into that one single SWAT map that we use to manage all soil applied inputs. And all these layers are based on very stable properties that really don't change year to year. So when a SWAT map is made, it's in theory good forever. We start with electrical connectivity data, primarily from the SWAT box, our proprietary soil mapping system that's very easy and efficient. We also collect very accurate RTK elevation data, or we can access that from LIDAR in certain areas as well. And from that, we can create water flow and water accumulation layers. We can create a topography model, which is very different than elevation. And in some areas, we can get even soil color imagery that represents surface soil organic matter fairly well. So any of these layers can go together in combination somehow that represents the map and soil variability in that field. Once the maps are made, they're ground truthed by a SWAT certified agronomist that actually physically goes out to the field, will drive around and understand the, the underlying factors that affect the variability in that field. So this field, for example, in these dark green zone 10s has some salinity and you can see the effect of relatively poor crop or really no crop in that overhead drone photo. These red zone ones are relatively coarse textured soils, even gravelly that have poor water holding capacity. And that often shows in this, in this case in the stubble color as well. So those are some things that agronomists might be looking for when ground truthing, but obviously involves taking some soil cores too.
Once the field is ground truthed, it can be soil sampled right away. And this is done through the SWAT records app. And the app itself will drop soil test points that can then be actually moved around to specific little points where the agronomist wants to take the soil cores from. And typically, we'll soil sample five out of the 10 zones. And that's more than enough soil sample data. Usually in one individual zone, there will be multiple points within that zone. And the cores from each of those points will all go in to make that one sample from that one management zone. Once the soil sample results are back, the agronomist can sit down and work through a plan with the farmer and come up with the best rates to be applied in each zone. Commonly variable rate seed is used as well because really response to plant population is also determined by these soil water and topography factors too, similar to fertilizer. This prescription here represents an air seeding unit with four different tanks, one with anhydrous ammonia, one with canola seed, one with phosphate and one with sulfur. So in that case, they can variable rate four different products actually. Once in season comes, an important part of the process is understanding plant population and opportunities to vary seeding rate by management zone. So again, this is very commonly done in Western Canada, but it's important to really understand what you're achieving in every part of the field. And this is a really good way of evening out maturity. Uh, in some cases, in some salt affected soils like this one, we can increase seeding rates to get a little more plant competition against weeds and try and even out maturity as, as much as you can. And again, those observations can be logged all through SWAT records and available to farmers. Later in the season, typically an agronomist would come back and do some visual assessments of the crop, looking for anything that can be done differently um, and just understand the relative variability in the field. In this case, we're looking at a really dry zone one where the crop is fairly drought affected and really only a few feet away in zone five, quite a dramatic difference in the look of this barley. Everything is ultimately driven through what we call the SWAT ecosystem. So the SWAT box is our proprietary device again that we can use for EC mapping. That flows through SWAT records through the cloud automatically to make SWAT maps. And then everything else is driven through there. So we've got a couple new products called SWAT Cam and SWAT Water, which I'm not going to cover in this session today, but very quickly, SWAT water is commercial and, and with the ability to install soil moisture probes in the field and get more specific texture data, we can actually create spatial water maps based on soil properties. We can also connect to John Deere Operations Center and Climate Field View for some sharing of um, spatial data as well through those, those systems. So in summary, a SWAT map is a soil potential map. That's what we like to call it. And it's based on stable soil properties that reflect the spatial variability across the landscape. It really becomes the crop management framework that reflects the relative responsiveness to essentially all soil applied inputs. And that might be fertilizer, amendments like lime, manure, compost, seed, and even soil applied herbicides. What it's not is a yield or NDVI based zone map. Those, those are what we've gotten really used to in the industry. But again, that really doesn't determine nutrient responsiveness. There is normally a relationship to yield, but it's not always linear. So often the highest yielding part of the field maybe would be in zone six or seven or eight. It all depends on the field and that gets really field specific. But yield is a product of both spatial and temporal variability. Temporal variability, the big one, primarily being rainfall in that any given year. So in a really, really wet year, you actually might have zones 8 to 10 totally flooded out. And zone 1 might yield fairly well. In a dry year, zone 1 might be really poor. And zones 8, 9, and 10 might do actually the best. So it all depends. Hopefully that's a good overview of SWAT maps and helps you understand what they are, how they're made and how they can be used. There's a lot more information at swapmaps.com.
or you can follow us in social media at SWAT Maps. You can also email sales at swapmaps.com if you're interested in getting more information or search the hashtag SWAT Maps or SWAT Agronomy on most social media platforms and you can see how different agronomists and farmers are using SWAT Maps around the world. Thank you for your attention.